Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Well, there are few things that I've lived by all my life, which is probably why I'm still alive today. And one of them is this. Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it couldn't, but he'd be the one that wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. People have told me over the years, there were so many things I wouldn't be able to do, but fortunately for me, I didn't listen. I have never listened. You can ask my mum. <laughs> I am defiant, always have been. And you might think of that word in a negative way, right? Defiance, is that a child screaming on the ground or a fist shaking in the air? But what I'm gonna to say to you today, that defiance is not just a good thing, defiance is a great thing. Defiance is where we find our courage, our grit and our boldness. But how do we connect with that? Would you like to know? Would you like to know? Okay, well, I'm gonna share with you today three magic words that will help you unleash your defiance and the defiant human spirit, which Viktor Frankl says, enables us to tap into our spiritual force to overcome suffering. How do we find it? Three magic words and those words are love the hills. What do I mean by that? Love the hills. Is anyone here go, anyone jog? Jog, walk, ride a bike? Okay, so you go out for your morning jog, walk, bike ride, and there's a flat course and a hilly course. Which one do you take? The flat? Did someone say the flat? Everyone says the flats. And you know why? It's in our DNA. In fact, Freud says we are biologically motivated to head towards pleasure and avoid pain. But what if we've got it the wrong way round? What if we're actually meant to take the hills? What if we're meant to take the hard option? What if that is how we find our purpose and our meaning? What if the hills are where we find our defiant human spirit? How different would it be if I told you that you had that and you had everything you need to overcome any challenging life, wouldn't that be a game changer? Wouldn't that change things, right? Well, I always trained on the hills. I had a nickname of Janine the Machine. I started my athletic career at the ripe old age of seven with little athletics in Australia. But I discovered very early on cross-country skiing. And cross-country skiers love the hills. <clears throat> I know you're probably thinking Australia, what, snow in Australia? Yes, absolutely. We actually have ideal conditions for cross-country skiing. My goal was not just to represent my country at the Olympics. I really wanted to put Australia on the map as a force to be reckoned with, to show the world that this Aussie could ski and nothing was gonna stop me from achieving that dream. I was invited by the Canadian ski team coach to join up with their team in preparation for the 88 Winter Olympics in Calgary. Every athlete's dream. I came back and made plans to go and train with the Canadian team in the lead up to the Olympics. Nothing was going to stop me from achieving this dream. Then one warm autumn day, I set out on a training bike ride with my fellow teammates. We were riding from Sydney to the Blue Mountains, which is about a six hour ride. We'd been on our bikes for around five and a half hours when we got to the part of the ride that I loved and that was the hills because I loved the hills, right? And I got up off the seat of my bike and started pumping my legs and as I sucked in the cold mountain air, I could feel it burning my lungs and I looked up and everything went black. Where was I? What had happened? My body was consumed with pain. I'd been hit by a speeding truck with only 10 minutes to go on the bike ride. I was airlifted by the Westpac Rescue Helicopter to a large spinal unit in Sydney. I had extensive and life-threatening injuries. I'd broken my neck and my back in six places. 
I'd broken five ribs on my left side. I'd broken my right arm. I'd broken my right collarbone. I broke bones in my feet. My whole right side was ripped open and filled with gravel. I had head injuries. My head was cut across the front, lifted back, exposing the skull underneath. I had internal injuries and I had massive blood loss. In fact, I lost about five litres of blood, which is all someone my size would actually hold. By the time the helicopter arrived at Prince Henry Hospital in Sydney, my blood pressure was 40 over nothing. I was having a really bad day. <laughs> Well, I might be able to laugh about it now. You can imagine what it was like for my parents, every parent's worst nightmare, with the news that their child had been involved in an accident like this. They drove down to this hospital on this rainy afternoon. I have absolutely no memory of this accident. The doctors called it post-traumatic amnesia, but the reason I don't remember is I'd already left my body. And for 10 days in intensive care, it was the fight of my life. There was one part of me lying in my body in excruciating pain and the other part was detached and pain-free looking down. I didn't want to go back to this body. Why would I? This body was broken. This body would no longer serve me. I wanted to leave this body for good. But for some reason, I couldn't. There was something keeping me, pulling me into this body. And what I didn't know at the time was that my father was holding my hand. He said a prayer. He said, God, give my strength and give it to Janine. I believe that was my lifeline. That was the anchor that kept me attached to this body. After 10 days, I remember opening my eyes and seeing my father's face looking down at me. I knew there was something I just had to ask. And I looked up into my father's face and I said, Dad, how's my bike? <laughs> I had my priorities, right? Well, my bike wasn't in good shape and neither was I. Even though the bleeding had stopped, I was paralyzed from the waist down. They did some tests. They discovered that there was a blockage in my spinal cord. They said, we're going to have to operate. If we don't operate, she will be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. And if we do, there's just a small chance that she might walk again, but it's delicate spinal surgery. They spent six hours operating on me. For spinal surgery like this, they cut around my entire body. I have a scar that wraps around my body. The orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons went in. They picked as much bone as they could that had lodged in my spinal cord. They took out two of my broken ribs and they mended my back. They fused T12, L1 and L2. And when they stitched me up, I remember waking up in intensive care in this incredible pain. The only way that I could breathe was to have a big stack of towels on my chest. I had a big drain coming out of my side, draining blood. But the doctors were excited because at that point I had a flicker of movement in the big toe on my right foot. And I remember thinking, great, because I'm going to the Olympics. I had no idea. I mean, I knew, pe knew people broke their necks and backs and didn't walk again, but hey, that's the sort of thing that happens to someone else, right? Can you imagine coming into work today and waking up paralyzed in a spinal ward? It's everyone's worst nightmare. And even though the operation was a success, the doctor said to me, Janine, the damage is permanent. There's central nervous system nerves and there is no cure. So you're going to have these injuries for the rest of your life. They're permanent. I had no feeling from the waist down. She said, you'll never be able to go to the bathroom normally again. You're going to have to use a catheter. I remember her saying to me, you're going to have to rethink everything you do in your life because you are never going to be able to do the things you did before. <laughs> that was devastating. I was in my last year at university at the time. I wanted to become an exercise physiologist. My whole life revolved around sport. I was going to the Olympics. And then someone was telling me that everything I'd worked for my entire life was gone. There are things I remember about that hospital. I remember there was, it's really brightly lit when you're in intensive care and there was this noise that went shh, shh, shh. And I called the nurse over and I said, nurse, what is that noise? She said, Janine, it's the lady opposite. It's her respirator. I said, well, would you turn it off? I want to get some sleep. <laughs> they didn't, <laughs> fortunately. But as difficult as it was, being in that spinal ward was also rich and meaningful and taught me so many lessons about life. It stripped me of my sense of entitlement. 
and entitlement kills joy. I could never ask why me when all I had to do was look around me and there were people worse off like Maria who was a complete quadriplegic who had woke up on a coma on her 18th birthday with the news that she will only ever be able to move her head. And she always smiled. I always thought that I could will everything to happen in my life, just hard work and it'll all be okay. But when you're lying paralyzed in a spinal ward, it's pretty obvious that that's not the case. And I realize that sometimes you can't change the circumstances of your life. And when you can't change the circumstances, you're forced to change your reaction to them. I also learned about the power of service, an altruistic act. Because I was cared for by staff, by nurses and doctors and other staff around the clock who gave above and beyond. Like the nurse who sat by my bedside when I was having a hard night and just wiped my forehead and sat there and talked to me all night, to the people that had to change bedpans and catheter bags. I realised that you make a living out of what you get, but you make a life out of what you give. I spent almost six months in that hospital, six months. Now you imagine lying flat on your back, looking up at a ceiling and not moving for almost six months. When I left, I was covered in a plaster body cast. I was in a wheelchair attached to a catheter bottle. Life could not have been any different. They told me, you know, be prepared. You're going to get depressed when you get home. I went, not me, not, not Janine the machine. I'm going home to learn how to walk again. I had no idea. And I got home and I realised that that nurse who had said that to me, she was right. All of my friends were off skiing and racing and I was at home. I weighed just over 70 pounds. I had a body, no feeling from the waist down, attached to a catheter bottle in a wheelchair. I wanted to just put my shoes on and run out the door, but I couldn't. And I got so depressed. Not just, you know, I'm having a bad day because we all have those. The sort of depression where you think, why did I choose to come back to this body? This is not the life that I worked for. One driver, one speeding driver who was charged with negligent driving and got an $80 fine. He had taken my dreams from me and I was so angry and I wanted to give up. And I remember sitting on my bed, my mum sitting on my bed and we were crying and she said, I wonder if life will ever be good again. And I thought, how could it? Because I've lost everything that I valued. But you know what? This is a point in life, a crossroads, a choice point that we all get to. This is not just a provocation. This is an invitation. Life is asking you a question. Will you stay down or will you get up? Will you continue to say no or will you say yes to life? And this decision is not optional, only the timing. Because when you say yes to life, you say yes to all of life. You cannot cherry pick all of the experiences of life. And I thought, I'm going to say yes. And you know what happens when you say yes? Everything changes. Everything. I was outside in my wheelchair in my plaster cast and an aeroplane flew over. And I remember I looked up and I thought to myself, that's it. If I can't walk, then maybe I can fly. And I said, Mom, I'm going to learn how to fly. And she said, oh, that's nice, dear. <laughs> Would you like another cup of tea? <laughs> it was crazy. I had never wanted to fly in my life. But now it was exactly what I needed to do. But how, how do I do this? So I, I said, pass me the yellow pages. OK, Jim, you probably don't remember. <laughs> do you remember when you had the book with the phone numbers? Come on, does anyone remember that? <laughs> right, OK. But I said, pass me the yellow pages. Now to be like, Siri. Give me the, you know. So, and I looked up F for flying schools. And I rang up the first one near us and I said, hi, I want to learn about flying lessons. And they started to tell me about this thing called a TIFF, 
which stands for a trial instructional flight. I said, great. They said, do you want to make a booking to come out? I said, sure. I said, but I, I have to get a friend to drive me out because I can't drive. I sort of can't walk either. But is that a problem? And there's this pregnant pause on the end of a phone, like, oh, we've got a nutcase here. And I knew what it was that I had to do. So, of course, I, I, I couldn't walk. Mum went out. I had a plaster. My whole torso was in plaster. Mum went out and bought me a pair of baggy overalls to put over this plaster cast. I rang a friend of mine, Chris, who lived in a different state and said, you know, there's a seat in the back. He'd always wanted to fly. I said, if you come out, you can come out flying too. And weeks and weeks later, me in my plaster body cast and my baggy overalls and Chris and mum drove me out to our local airport. They got me out of the car and holding, um, you know, 70 pounds, there was nothing of me, right? Holding me under the arms, they sort of walked me into the flying school. And I can tell you, I did not look like the ideal candidate <laughs> to get a pilot's license. <laughs> and they're like, hi, I'm like, hi, I'm here for my flying lesson. And they go, okay, just wait a second. And they go out the back and they're like, who's going to take her? You, you take her. No, you take her. Okay, because this guy comes out and he goes, I'm Andrew and I'm going to take you flying. I go, great. So they carry me down to the tarmac and there was this red, white and blue light aeroplane. Now, I know some people know what this is like because I know we've got a couple of pilots in this room. But to get into a light aircraft, you've got to be really agile. You actually have to step up onto a step. You have to climb onto the wing. You probably fly, do you? Yes, I can see from you. Yeah, I know that. And you've got to get into the cockpit, right? I'm being held up in a plaster body cast, right? And they're like, oh, so they, one of them has to sort of pull me up onto the wing. And then they pushed me and they somehow got me into the cockpit. Chris got in the back, Andrew got in the front, he turns the aeroplane on, he said, right, do you want to have a go at taxiing? And I said, no, I can't use my legs. He goes, oh, I said, but I can use my hands. And he goes, okay, <laughs> who have we got here? <laughs> and he gets over to the runway, he gets a clearance from the tower and off we go down the runway. And as the wheels lift off the ground, I had not felt this excited for, I couldn't remember, it was magic. And we got over the training area and Andrew said, right. He said, you see that mountain over there? And I go, yeah. He goes, you take the controls and head towards that mountain. And I said, okay. So I took the controls and I was heading towards the mountain west of Sydney where I had had that accident, where that journey had begun. And Andrew said, turn left and right. And I turned a little bit left and right. And he goes, you can go a bit steeper than that. So I went a bit steeper to the left and a bit steeper to the right. And I looked in the back at my friend Chris and he was going, oh, my God, <laughs> give back the controls. No way. I knew then I was going to be a pilot. I had no idea how I'd ever pass a medical, but I'd worry about that later. Andrew waved goodbye and thought he'd never see me again. I got, you know, my mum to drive past the bookshop to get the books I'd need to study for my basic aeronautical knowledge. And I went home and I had a plan. I got my training diary out, I ripped a page out, and every day I would lie on the ground. All I could do was lift my leg about that far off the ground. And I couldn't look back to where I'd been. All I could do was to look forward. And I practised my walking. And I went from the point of, you know, two people holding me up to one person holding me up to the point where I could walk around the house holding onto the furniture like this. And then I made great progression to the point where I could walk around the house holding onto the walls like this. And mum said she was forever following me, wiping off my fingerprints. <laughs> but she said at least she always knew where I was. And then I got my plaster cast removed. They put a brace on. They said, you can have a shower. I had my first shower in seven months. And what a relief that was for mum and dad. <laughs> and I thought, now I'm ready to go for my medical. There are only certain doctors that can test for a pilot's medical. So I booked in for one. Mum took me out. Dr. Henderson, this old guy with glasses on the end of his nose, we walked in, me and my steel brace and my baggy overalls and mum holding me up, right? And he goes, what are you here for? I said, I'm here for a pilot's medical. He goes, oh. Well, we better get started. So we got the form out from the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and I had everything on the form. Ever had a head injury? Ever broken this? Ever, I'm just going, yep, yep. And he's got sweat dripping off his brow and he wanted me to do this test that I thought was really irrelevant to flying. For example, have you ever been to a doctor's surgery where you go in, you sit on a chair and they get that little hammer 
and they tap you on the knee, right? You sit like this, right? And they test your knee jerk reflex. You know that one because I know we've got some pilots here. Right, well, I don't have a knee jerk reflex anymore, but that's a really easy one to fake. <laughs> Shh. I thought, well, that's silly. That's not going to stop me from flying, right? He said, but Janine, I want you to fly. I don't want you to kill anybody. I said, fair enough. He said, OK, if you get a letter from your surgeon, I'll recommend we pass you. So I went back to my doctor. I said, Dr. Stephen, you've got to write this letter. He said, but Janine, you can't feel your legs. You can't. You, I, don't worry. Andrew's doing the legs. I'm doing the arms until I'm strong enough. Just write the letter. And he did. And I went on with my study and I went on with my exercise and there was something burning inside of me so brightly. <sighs> I'm going to be a pilot. <laughs> Months passed, the letter came in the mail. I ripped it open and they'd passed me. And that was my green light to fly. And there I was out at this flying school, all 70 pounds of me in my steel brace, my baggy overalls, my bag of medications and catheters and my funny walk. And all these young guys that wanted to be Qantas pilots. <laughs> and they looked at me and thought, who is she kidding? And sometimes I thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? But there was something inside of me that said, Janine, inch by inch, it's a cinch. Just keep footing, putting one foot in front of the other. And that's what I did. And while the doctors continued to put my body back together again. I had so many operations I've lost count. I had claw toes. My toes were clawed like this, common to spinal cord injury patients. I couldn't get my feet in shoes. Made it very difficult to walk. I had all my toes cut and pinned straight. I had tendon transfers in my legs. But every time I was out at the flying school, there was that little piece of magic. Like when I went for that first solo. <laughs> And I remember looking next to me and thinking, oh, my goodness, I have to land this thing on my own. <laughs> How am I going to stop the aeroplane? You see, I, my legs are very similar to someone that's got polio. From the knees down, I really barely have any strength. I can't even stand up on my toes. So I had to figure out a way to do this. OK, if I sit forward with some pillows, slide my feet up and push with my upper legs, maybe I can stop this. And it did. It took me the whole runway and I stopped it. And then I went out in the training area for the first time. And then I got this magical piece of paper, 407751, which was my private pilot's license. And I was so proud because I knew how close I'd been to giving up. And mum and dad, they were really proud too. But they were my first passengers. <laughs> it scared them to death. <laughs> but they couldn't say no. <laughs> and then I went on and I learned to navigate and I flew my little aeroplane around Australia and got what's called my unrestricted license. And then I thought, well, the next step was a commercial pilot's license. And I can't be a commercial pilot. I am actually a walking paraplegic. Who would give me a job as a commercial pilot? I mean, imagine you get together with some friends and you charter an aeroplane to go away for the weekend and then the pilot comes down. <laughs> oh, what happened to you? Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> you know, um, I don't have any feeling from the waist down. You know, I got run over by a truck, you know, but lightning doesn't strike twice. Jump on in. <laughs> right, would you get in? Probably not. But the guy at the flying school said, if you get your commercial pilot's license and your instructor rating, I'll give you a job. Oh, my gosh. So I had to go back and have another medical, like a higher level medical. So I went back to that same doctor. Because <laughs> when you're on a good thing, right, you stick to it, right? And I got cleared for my commercial pilot's license. I went on, I got my night rating. I got my commercial pilot's license. I got my instructor rating. And then I found myself back at that same school where I'd gone for that very first TIFF, teaching other people how to fly in just over one year after I'd left the spinal ward. And I couldn't believe it. If someone had said to me, you're going to have to live your life without sport, I would have thought, no way, <laughs> no way in the world. But I loved this. This was the most incredible experience. I loved taking people up and looking at their face for the first time and sharing this joy of flight with them. But then just near this flying school were these little black aeroplanes that went upside down. And I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. <laughs> and mum said, oh. And I, then I went on and I learned to fly upside down. And then I became an aerobatics 
flying instructor, teaching people how to fly upside down. And mum and dad? <laughs> Never been up. <laughs> the doctor said I wouldn't live. The doctor said I wouldn't walk. The doctor said, fly? She can't fly. But now I knew for certain that my body was limited, but it was my spirit that was unstoppable. The doctor said I would never have children. They got that wrong too. <laughs> I got married and I'm the mother of three beautiful children, which are the joy of my life. And oh, I should mention this, I sort of feel like I'm part of the family because my daughter Annabelle worked at Google in Sydney. So does that mean I'm part of the family? Yeah, yeah, I can be like a Googler by, you know, whatever, relation. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, people ask me all the time about flying. Why did you choose flying? And I have to be honest and say, you know what? I actually think that flying chose me. I could not think of a better way, a better metaphor for freedom than the magic of flight, right? In fact, we have this formula in flying that goes attitude plus power equals performance. Now, this formula is based on physics and it flies everything from a 747 to a glider. It doesn't fail. And I found that this formula that works in flying works in our life as well. Our attitude is how we navigate life. Our attitude is the story of our life based on our beliefs, our opinions, our judgments. And we are the producers, the directors, the actors in this story. And the amazing thing about this, if we have this amazing power to create whatever story we want, and that power, let me tell you, it's a superpower, is the power of choice. Viktor Frankl says, anything can be taken from a man, but the last of human freedom, to choose your attitude in any set of circumstances. What do you choose? Whatever you're going through, is it happening to you or is it happening for you? Is this an obstacle or is this an opportunity? What's the gift in this? If we're going to create a story, why don't we make it one that uplifts and inspires? Why don't we choose that? Because when we choose that, that's how we build a better family, a better Google, a better community, a better country, a better world. And while we're doing that, we're pulling everyone along with us. And that's truly how we change the world. So let me finish with this. I challenge you today. What is your hill? Is it personal? Is it professional? Is it financial? Is it in relationships? Is it spiritual? What is it? And now ask yourself, what is one thing, no matter how small or simple, that I can do that will start me on the journey of climbing that hill. And whatever it is, go out and do it. And then tomorrow, wake up and ask yourself the same question. What is one thing, no matter how small or simple? And then do that thing. And then do that every single day. And then before you know it, 
You're going to look over your shoulder and you're going to say, oh, I climbed that hill. And you might just find that you have done something that you once thought was out of reach or maybe not even possible. And that, my friends, is your defiant human spirit. And while you're out there doing that, you are bound to come across someone who is going to say to you, you're never going to be able to do that. Give up now, believe me, I know. And when someone says that to me, I remember this. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophecy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done and you'll do it. Thank you. <laughs>